Hey Optimancers, Chris here. I'm finishing up my focus summoning build videos today and I saved the best for last. I love this concept, this build, and the results. But before we get into the build, here's my mandatory spiel about watching my video on why I'm making optimized summoning builds using the summoning spells from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. I've linked it right at the top of the screen for you. Check it out, come back, then continue watching this. This is the third summoning build I've done using these spells. The other two are the Dread Necromancer and the Scion of Cthulhu, using the Necromancer Wizard and Fathomless Patron Warlock respectively. This one uses the Aberrant Mind Sorcerer. And it's kind of weird, I wanted to do an Aberrant Mind build on this channel for quite a while, and now I have two Aberrant Mind builds in pretty close succession. Though the concepts for the builds are very, very different, as is the build itself. Our story starts with a simple kobold. She and her pack, like so many kobolds, are enslaved by an evil dragon, dwelling in the deep, dark caves beneath a great mountain. I hope that dragon gets its just desserts. Well, who boy, does it ever. Because it just so happens that, in this case, those deep, dark caves look like a pretty good home for a Mind Flayer enclave. The dragon was subdued, and the enclave had a great idea. Maybe the dragon might be a nice host for the enclave's elder brain. Bye-bye, dragon. Hello, Elder Brain Dragon. Most of our characters' pack were either killed, or they simply went from one slavery to the next. However, the Elder Brain Dragon sent something different in our character. Something strange and powerful. The weirdest thing of all, though, this Elder Brain felt an attraction to this kobold. In fact, it thought if it created a connection to this kobold, she might blow their mind. Okay, that was terrible. Very sorry. But regardless, our character gains an awful power with this link, and she goes into the outside world changed in a very eerie and unnatural presence with psionic powers that continually grow more and more unstoppable. Okay, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on levels 1 through 6 because we get into the summoning at level 7. But I'll give you some basics. You probably want the sleep spell at level 1, but you'll trade that out later. You'll want mage armor right from level 1, otherwise your armor class will be terrible. At level 3, you'll probably want the web spell, and then probably hypnotic pattern or fear at level 5. But we'll trade out some of those once we start concentrating on summoning most of the time, because we want to get some non-concentration options. So we're going to look at this character from level 7, and then we're going to go right to level 20 with this build. I'll insert some regular damage calculations, because, oh boy, we can deliver damage. By the way, if you want to see the 20th level character sheet, I've linked it in the video description. So first off, why Kobold? Well, for Draconic Cry. Draconic Cry allows us to provide a pretty substantial buff to our party by using a bonus action. The mechanics are pretty simple. We use our bonus action, and any attacks against any of our enemies that were within 10 feet of us that could hear us will have advantage. This is a huge boost for your party, but guess what? It is a huge scaling buff to our summoned creature. And yeah, I'll show you how much when we get to the math. So we're small size, 30 foot movement speed, 60 foot dark vision, and we get Kobold Legacy. This allows us to choose from three options, either a craftiness for an extra skill proficiency, defiance for advantage on saving throws against the frightened condition, or draconic sorcery for a sorcerer cantrip. Truly craftiness, it's a no brainer selection here. So take craftiness, I took survival, but take a different skill if you like, but skip Defiance and Draconic Sorcery. We're taking the plus 2, plus 1 option for ability scores for Constitution and Charisma. The plus 2 for Charisma, of course. And by level 7, we'll have an 8 Strength, 15 Dexterity, 16 Constitution, 8 Intelligence, 8 Wisdom, and 18 Charisma. So, regarding skill proficiencies and background, take what you like. I took the Urchin background. I mean, there's no Slave of a Dragon background, but I don't know. We can rename it. I grab Persuasion and Deception as class skills. Okay, so as a sorcerer, we're using Charisma for spellcasting, and it says, An event in our past left an indelible mark on you. Yeah, that's a big check mark. Aberrant Mind is a really solid sorcerer subclass. Let's just go through what we've already got at 7th level. Psionic Spells gives us just a ton of extra spells. We've already gotten everything up to 7th level on this chart. And whenever we level up, we can switch a spell here with another that's either Divination or Enchantment on the Wizard, Sorcerer, or Warlock spell list. Also, this is an entirely different feature than our normal Sorcerer spell selection, 
So you can actually switch two spells when you level up, one from psionic spells and one from your regular sorcerer spells. Now I'm just going to list the spells that are available to switch to that I think are pretty good candidates for switching these spells. So there's Silvery Barbs, if your table uses that spell, Tasha's Hideous Laughter, Locate Object, Suggestion, Tasha's Mind Whip, Confusion, Rowlethim's Psychic Lance, Hold Monster, and Synaptic Static. Now, if you're wondering if I forgot to list the third level spells, unfortunately, I didn't. There just aren't very good enchantment and divination spells on these lists for third level. So switching out Arms of Hadar is pretty obvious. I'll be switching that for Tasha's Hideous Laughter. Yeah, it is a concentration spell, so we won't use it while our summon is active, but it is really nice and cheap as a twin spell option. A creature that fails at saving throw is incapacitated and falls prone. That is a pretty harsh debuff on an enemy, potentially taking them out of the fight for several rounds. We'll keep Dissonant Whispers, which is also a good twin spell option and doesn't use concentration. The creature makes a saving throw or has to use its reaction to move as far from us as its speed will allow. It also takes 3d6 psychic damage, though the upcast option for this is poor, so we would just cast it at first level, but potentially twinned. Of course, we'll happily take the Mind Sliver Cantrip, Target's Intelligence, which is usually the best one to target, and you'll note that there is a lot of targeting intelligence with this particular build. Does some damage and gives a d4 penalty on the next saving throw before the end of our next turn. I'm going to switch Calm Emotions to Tasha's Mind Whip another non-concentration option, and another spell that requires an intelligence saving throw, which is typically a weak save on monsters. If the creature fails, it takes some damage, loses its reaction, and on its turn it has to choose whether to use its movement, take an action, or take a bonus action. This spell is particularly effective against creatures that don't have ranged attacks, because without a reaction, party members can just back away, and then the creature has no good options on their turn. I'm going to keep the deck thoughts. It's a utility spell and definitely comes up, and I think it's thematically appropriate for a character as well. So third level spells. I'll keep sending. Sending is a useful spell. Basically, it's your long range communication spell. Also, thematically, again, probably the right choice. Hunger of Hadar, though, mm, I think we need to switch that out. And I guess we'll take tongues. There's occasionally some useful utility. Also, the telepathy we get through Aberrant Mind isn't one of those kinds that bypasses language restrictions. For fourth level spells, we'll switch out Black Tentacles for Rowlethim's Psychic Lance. This is a non-concentration option. It does okay damage, targets that weak intelligence saving throw, and incapacitates the target. Use this one against non-intelligence-based spellcasters or enemies with a big ranged action. This one also shuts down legendary actions. And of course, we'll switch out Summon Aberration for Confusion. That was me casting Confusion on you. Did you make your saving throw? Because of course we keep Summon Aberration. I mean, it is the main focus of the build after all. Now, what I really love about this one is the Beholderkin has a 150 foot range attack. It delivers reliable psychic damage and it gets a fly speed with hover. So we'll summon our little Beholder, float it behind the party, like probably out of area of effect spell behind the party and just snipe away with it on its turn. Ideally, if there's a corner to float behind after its turn, all the better. Of all the three summon builds I've done for these spells, this one is definitely the most durable because with that long range attack, it has the least likelihood of being targeted with damage effects. Okay, so telepathic speech. So we have telepathy, uses our bonus action. And once we set this up, it has good range. It is not a limited use thing, so you can use this as often as you like. You just know our little kobold will be flashing images like this. Submit to the Elder Brain. Submit. Submit. Level 6 is a really nice level for subclass features on the Aberrant Mind Sorcerer. Psionic Sorcery lets us cast our psionic spells without components, so it's kind of the ultimate subtle spell. If there is a component consumed by the spell, then you need that component. But you know what's really nice here? Well, Summon Aberration has a costly component, but it is not consumed by the spell, so we can just skip that part. Go Psionics. Also, we can cast Psionic spells either by expending spell slots or sorcery points equal to the spell's level. And here's Font of Magic, which we got at second level. You can see converting a spell into sorcery points is a bonus action on your turn. You can expend one spell slot and gain a number of sorcery points equal to the slot's level. 
So if we convert a slot, then we get a number of sorcery points equal to that slot's level. And if we use Sonic spells to cast, we can expend sorcery points equal to the spell's level. So it's an even trade. That is not something that sorcerers usually get. Usually sorcerers, if they want to create spell slots with their sorcery points, they have to use the chart right here, and you'll see that this is not a favorable conversion rate for them. And we get another feature at 6th level. Psychic Defenses gives us resistance to psychic damage and advantage on saving throws against being charmed or frightened. So remember when we were talking about Kobold and I said the extra skill was a no-brainer? Well, we're a sorcerer, so we have the Sorcerer Cantrips already, even an extra one because of the Aberrant Mind psionic spells, and now we have the advantage against being frightened. So yeah, the extra skill is a no-brainer. And our wisdom save on this character is not going to be good. So advantage on these saves that are usually wisdom is not a bad thing to have. All right, so that's what the subclass gives us. Let's look at the base class. So metamagic. My first pick is extended spell. Summon aberration is a one hour duration. Extend that and you can even take a short rest and you can still have your summon creature afterwards. And twin spell. I already mentioned some spells that are great and cheap twin spell options, so let's grab the meta magic. At 4th level, we're going to grab Fey Touched, that gives us Misty Step, and I've selected the Command spell as a 1st level option. It's another non-concentration spell that upcasts well, or for a sorcery point you could twin it. This also gets our Charisma up to 18. Alright, let's talk about the rest of our spells. We actually have to cast these with components like a chump. So, starting with our cantrips, I took Firebolt. It's a d10 scaling damage, which is one of the better cantrip damages. And I've mentioned this regularly, but this cantrip is the one that lets you cast it on objects. So you can use it to burn through the locked door, for example. I mean, sometimes you just want to destroy something instead of someone. Frostbite, I mean, it's not something I would cast regularly. It has an okay debuff as a rider, causing disadvantage on an attack. But the saving throw is constitution, which is not ideal. But... We're a sorcerer, and sorcerers probably get more cantrips than they actually need. We've got Mage Hand for that useful utility. We also have Prestidigitation. That's, again, just for all that minor utility the spell offers. And Minor Illusion is one of the only illusions that doesn't use concentration. And there's some useful utility here, too, and potentially some combat applications as well. So for first-level spells, I've got Absorb Elements, a very strong first-level reaction spell. And speaking of strong first level reaction spells, of course I've got the shield spell. It is a must have spell, which is unfortunate, but if something's a must have, then you take it. And I have mage armor. This character is not an armor wearer. I mean, we can get armor proficiency, but I don't want to slow down our casting progression. And that will leave us with a weak 15 armor class. So we will need that shield spell. With second level spells, I selected blindness deafness, Largely because we can cast it while concentrating. Target's a strong saving throw, but it is a fairly cheap twin spell, and Blindness is a pretty strong debuff. I selected Web because if we aren't concentrating on summoning for some reason, this is a really strong control spell, especially for a second level spell. For third level spells, I added Counterspell. Fireball is non-concentration and can do some solid damage with a long range and a nice sized area of effect. Okay, so I'm explaining Fireball, probably the best known spell in the game. Dimension Door I added for 4th level spells. I'm probably using my 4th level slot at level 7 for Summon Aberration, but maybe not, and I'll explain that more later. And Dimension Door is a spell you want on your list. It has great utility, and it's just a get-out-of-emergencies kind of spell. So, we've got ourselves a whole lot of known spells. That's 6 cantrips and 18 known leveled spells. Almost half of them are psionic. Okay, now we're going to talk about the fun of psionic sorcery. So there is a big benefit of playing this particular summoner over, say, the Wizard Dread Necromancer build I presented recently. At 7th level, we would just have one 4th level slot. They could potentially recover it once with a short rest and arcane recovery. So a wizard could potentially do two summons. But we have extend spell and psionic spells, and we can cast it even more times than they can. So basically, we're going to use the hell out of this psionic spells feature. So we cast Summon Aberration. That's four sorcery points. Then we extend it. So that's five. We have two sorcery points left. So do we really need those second level slots? Eh, maybe not. So let's say we convert two of these. Now we're back up to six sorcery points. 
We cast Summon Aberration again, extend it again, and we're down to one sorcery point. So let's convert that third second level slot. That's two more sorcery points. And a third level slot. That's another five. Another extended Summon Aberration. And so on. This character can actually just summon Aberration as often as they need to cover all the combats you could possibly expect, even for a long day. That's something you're just not going to be able to do with anything but Aberrant Mind. Also, we didn't even use our 4th level slot, so Dimension Door is still available. So let's talk about damage. So at level 7, we're going to throw a Firebolt. I'm assuming a 60% chance to hit, so we're putting 0.65 here because we're adding the critical chance. So it's 0.65 times 11 is 7.15. Then our Beholderkin. 60% chance to hit times 11.5 times 2 is 13.8. 0 0.5 times 4.5 times 2 is 0 0.45. That is a total of 21.4 DPR or 20% over the baseline. Now, if we want to spike that damage, all we got to do is use our bonus action and we'll do a Draconic Cry. So if we do the Draconic Cry, now our Firebolt has an 84% chance to hit times 11 equals 9.24. Then 0 0.1 for criticals times 11 equals 1.1. Oh, and I'm going to bring this up because I think it's a funny story. But usually when I do damage calculations, assuming advantage, I'll find at least one comment and often multiple comments saying, um, actually, the chance to crit with advantage doesn't double. So it should be 0 0.0975. Listen, I round to two decimal places. It's a difference here of 0 0.03 damage. It is not significant. Though now I know the comment will be, um, actually, the difference is 0 0.0275. Anyway, we're adding our Beholderkin. 0 0.84 times 11.5 times 2 equals 18.48. And 0 0.1 times 4.5 times 2 equals 0 0.9, or 29.72 damage. That is 68% above our baseline. Now, just for clarity, we get a number of Draconic Cries equal to our proficiency bonus. This is not sustained DPR. But if we do want to spike our damage, this spikes our damage by 38.8785046728972%. Moving on. Well, the next time the baseline scales is level 11, so let's look at that. Then we're going to look at level 17, and then I'll cap off the build by upping up to 20th level. So we get another meta magic at level 10. I grabbed Heightened Spell. This is a meta magic that you want to grab later on because it's super expensive for low level spells. But if we twin an 8th level spell, costs 8 sorcery points, heightening it costs 3. So you can see the difference and why you would want this later in your build. For our psionic spells, I'm switching out Rary's Telepathic Bond for Synaptic Static. This is a good blast spell. Again, we're targeting intelligence. No concentration. It gives that d6 penalty to attack rolls. And check this out. It does psionic damage, and our summon is immune. I would still avoid our summon, though, because it could still get that d6 penalty to attacks, and we don't want that. And I'll keep telekinesis. It's a good spell, and if for some reason we don't want to summon, it's a strong alternative. At 8th level, I'll grab Resilient Dexterity. This improves our initiative, our armor class, and gives us proficiency in two of the three important saving throws. The other, I think, obvious option here is to take Resilient Wisdom instead. But if you do that, if you want to use this build, but you would rather have the stronger Wisdom saving throws, then you probably want to arrange the ability scores a bit differently. We get yet another cantrip. I just took Mold Earth, but pick what you like. I added the Fly spell, and yeah, it is Concentration. But if we need to fly, our options are limited. I mean, eventually we will have another fly option, but I'm still going to keep fly on the list because you can cast it on other people. And I added Vitriolic Sphere. Does a bit more damage than Fireball, but more importantly, it is a more reliable damage type. With this one, they actually take less than half the damage if they make their saving throw because they outright avoid the secondary damage. I am adding Wall of Stone. This one uses concentration, but if we concentrate the full duration, the wall is permanent. And this has some out-of-combat utility use. And I added mass suggestion because, you know, of course I did. Okay, so now we can talk strategy, and here's where I need to talk about summoning with Summon Aberration upcast to 6th level. So we can do that neat trick I talked about at level 7 to cast Summon Aberration as a 6th level spell multiple times, right? 
Actually, unfortunately, no. At least according to Sage Advice, we can't do it that way. So this is from Sage Advice. What level is a spell if you cast it without a spell slot? Such a spell is cast at its lowest level possible, which is the level that appears near the top of its description. Unless you have a special ability that says otherwise, the only way to increase the level of the spell is to expend a higher level spell slot when you cast it. It doesn't say you can use the sorcery points to cast your psionic spells at higher levels. And since it doesn't, then according to Sage Advice, you can't. This is actually fully in line with how the rules work. Everything that gives you spell slots seems to make sure you don't get extras of your 6th level spell slots and higher. Fauna Magic, you're restricted to 5th level spells or lower. How about Arcane Recovery, 5th level spells or lower. What about Warlock? Pack slots stop scaling up at 5th level spells, and Mystic Arcanum can only be used once. Land Druid's Natural Recovery, capped at 5th level spells. Harness Divine Power is actually capped at 3rd level spells. And unless your DM ignores the Sage advice and decides to interpret Sonic spells differently than the designers intended, we do not have a loophole. That said, I am still totally extending that Beholder Can I Summon with our one 6th level slot. So blast away with your 5th level and lower spells, and if we need extra summons, then you cast it at 4th level. For these damage calculations, I'm assuming the 6th level casting. And unfortunately, our chance to hit drops this time. I didn't increase my charisma, and assuming armor class is scaling faster than our proficiency bonus, we're now looking at a 55% chance to hit. Now I'm assuming a cantrip with our action here, but we'll have a fair number of spells, so there's a good chance we would throw a fireball or a synaptic static or something else instead. But using Firebolt at level 11, we have 0.6, which is the 55% chance to hit, plus the 5% chance to crit, times 16.5 is 9.9, .9, and then our Beholderkin has a 55% chance to hit, times 13.5 average damage per attack, times 3 attacks is 22.28, and 5% chance to crit times 4.5 times 3 is 0.68. Add those all together, we're at 32.86 or 21% over baseline. Now, what happens if we do a Draconic Cry? Well, our Firebolt now has an 80% chance to hit for 16.5 damage or 13.2. Then add 0.1 times 16.5 equals 1.65. And then our Beholderkin has an 80% chance to hit times 13.5 times 3 is 32.4. And then 0.1 times 4.5 times 3 is 1.35. That is 48.6, or 79% over our baseline. Now moving on, we're going to go up to 17th level, where the baseline scales again. We're going to take Distance Spell. This can double the range of a spell. And if it does have a range of touch, we get a 30-foot range. At 12th level, we'll increase our Charisma score to 20. And we get another really nice feature at 14th level. So this is Revelation in Flesh. It's our subclass feature. This gives us yet another bonus action option. It is super cheap. One sorcery point is nothing at 14th level. And we transform ourselves for 10 minutes. Though if we want, this does give us the option. We can spend more sorcery points and get more of these features. So if you want, you can spend four sorcery points and you get them all. So the Mind Flayers have tentacles on their faces. Well, we can have that too, but they would be eye tentacles and the ability to see invisible creatures. A flying speed. And this one is not concentration. We also get hover. A swimming speed, twice our walking speed. And, I guess, turn into an ooze, move through spaces as narrow as one inch, and escape grapples and restraints. And yeah, I mean, the only one I'd probably worry about having up, like before I go into combats, is the flying one. We are totally going to use that all the time. And the others, I mean, I'd use them as they're needed. It's only a bonus action if you do. At 16th level, we get alert for that plus 5 bonus to initiative and immunity to being surprised, and there's the no advantage to being attacked by unseen enemies. Remember, when we roll initiative, we're not just rolling for ourselves, we're rolling for our summon creature as well. We pick up the Crown of Stars spell, yet another bonus action. This one gives us a ranged 40-12 radiant damage attack. You get 7 of them with 1 casting. We'll take Teleport. Not something I normally cast in combat, but massive utility outside of combat. And 8th level spells? Yeah, I'm not taking any 8th level spells. Summon Apparition is my 8th level spell. But 9th level spells? You bet. So I went back and forth between Wish and Psychic Scream. 
but I decided I kind of want both of them, so I got rid of Blindness Deafness, and so I could select them both. However, we'll only be able to cast one, of course. So, Psychic Scream is just me being a slave to my concept. It is the right spell for this character. You choose up to 10 creatures in range, you add a distance spell metamagic if you need to, and they all make intelligence saving throws, and if you didn't use distance spell, you might want to heighten it, and then you can pick one of them to have disadvantage on that saving throw, because if they fail, they'll take 14d6 psychic damage and are stunned. They take half damage and no stun if they pass. Then if they are stunned, they get another saving throw at the end of each of their turns to end it, otherwise they stay stunned. By the way, it is not uncommon for creatures to have no chance to make an intelligence saving throw against a high level caster. If you target such a creature, they will be stunned and they will be stunned forever. Oh, and stun is not easy to get rid of. Like the Mercy Monk can do it, but Lesser Restoration, Greater Restoration, neither of them work to remove stun. So I got curious and went down a rabbit hole to see how would you get rid of the stun if you were affected by a Psychic Scream. Uh, so like I said, the Mercy Monk could do it, and there is not much else in the game. So part of the problem here is that the spell is instantaneous. Uh, so it has an instantaneous duration, and that means it's not applicable to dispel magic, even anti-magic won't affect the stun condition. So I was only able to find one other way in the game you can remove the stun condition from a creature, and that's Power Word Heal. And that's it. So Mercy Monk, Power Word Heal, otherwise stunned forever. Now I may have been overstating slightly, but I did really go far down the rabbit hole. And like even Wish isn't a 100% guaranteed to remove a stun, though it very likely would remove a stun, but it would have significant consequences for you to use it that way. And of course there are ways that you can enhance saving throws. So if a creature normally couldn't make their saving throw, maybe you could enhance it so that they could. That's another possibility, but it is really, really difficult to get rid of a stun if it has an instantaneous effect and no duration. And that affects both this spell, it actually also affects uh, Power Word Stun. But speaking of the Wish spell, of course, as I mentioned, I took the Wish spell on this character as well. So you'll have Psychic Scream and Wish, only one ninth level slot, but you get to choose which one you want to cast. Oh, I, I forgot to mention the most important part. If something dies from this spell, its head explodes. I want to finish off Tiamat with this spell so I can describe all five of her heads blowing up. Let's be honest, we're probably not casting Firebolt at all in combat anymore. We're going to have so many spell slots. So for damage calculations, I'm just going to assume Fireball or Synaptic Static are just being spammed. Now those are both spells that will likely hit multiple targets, but I am not going to add damage to multiple targets in my calculations. We're just going to look at the damage to a single enemy. Spreading damage around is just so different from single target damage, it's apples and oranges, and the comparisons end up not really telling you anything. Here's what I will tell you about multi-target damage is if you need to spread the damage around in order to exceed baseline, then you do not exceed baseline. Okay, so I'm going to do two calculations here, one with Draconic Cry, of course, but we have some other bonus action options, and I thought it'd be interesting. Let's assume with the first one that we have Crown of Stars up. I mean, between Crown of Stars and Draconic Cry, we might very well cover every single combat round we have in a day. Which damage calculation is going to be higher? Are we going to do more damage by using our bonus action for Crown of Stars, or are we going to do more damage using our bonus action for Draconic Cry? Well, let's start with Crown of Stars. So our Fireball or Synaptic Static or whatever, I'm using 0.75. That takes into account taking full damage if they fail their save, or half damage if they make it, times 28 average damage is 21. Then our Beholderkin, 60% chance to hit, times 15.5 per attack, times 4 attacks, 37.2. Then 0 0.05, chance to crit, times 4.5, times 4, is 0 0.9. And then our Moat from Crown of Stars, 60% chance to hit, times 26 average damage, is 15.6. And this one has a chance to crit, so 0 0.05 times 26 is 1.3, gives us a total damage of 76. Our baseline is 35.4 at this level. This is 115% over baseline. That's fantastic. Then we have our level 17, except this time we're using our bonus action for Draconic Cry. So our blast spell, the damage doesn't change. It stays at 21. 
but the Beholderkin is going to do a whole bunch more damage. So they have an 84% chance to hit, times 15.5, times 4 attacks, 52.08. 0 0.1 times 4.5 times 4 is 1.8. That gives us 74.88 damage per round, or 112% over baseline. So yeah, they're almost identical. It's 76 for the Crown of Stars, 74.88 here. Just about the same damage. And in both cases, fantastic damage. I mean, technically speaking, Draconic Cry is probably going to do more damage because I'm just including the Beholderkin and I'm not including the rest of the party that all have advantage as well. So, I mean, in reality, Draconic Cry will probably do more damage. But just for us alone, it's just about matching using Crown of Stars, which is a 7th level spell. Now, if you wanted to go straight Sorcerer from here, you could. But I want to get some armor and a shield on this character, and there's lots of ways to do it. We could grab Bard. I mean, with three levels, we could go Valor and get medium armor and shield, though we wouldn't get the actual armor and shield until level 20. I mean, we could get leather armor or studded leather armor, but that's worse than mage armor. We could grab a Hexblade dip, and then we would have a pack slot. I mean, if you want Eldritch Blast, you could grab two levels. And I really did consider that, but I have to tell you, I am sick of Hexblade dips. So instead, I grabbed Fighter. One level in Fighter gives us our medium armor and shield proficiency, and we can take a fighting style of defense, and that's going to increase our armor class even better. So our armor class jumps a lot. We get second wind for minor healing. Let's move on. So we're going to take a second level in Fighter for Action Surge. Action Surge is really good on a spellcaster. I mean, Action Surge is really good on anybody, including a spellcaster. Now, the nice thing about Action Surge is, so we have ways we can cast spells as a bonus action in the game, like if we took the Quicken spell Metamagic, but as soon as you cast a spell as a bonus action, any other spell you cast on that turn has to be a cantrip. However, if we want to cast two leveled spells on our turn, then what we need to do is, instead of casting as a bonus action, we need to get a second action. And Action Surge does that for us. So if we use our Action Surge, we can cast two leveled spells on the same turn. Now, I have to say, I was originally planning to go back to Sorcerer to get the final subclass feature. And that feature is Warping Implosion, and I don't like this feature. It is going to be really hard to use it effectively. I mean, if it didn't have Friendly Fire, then it might be worth thinking about how to make this work. But with the Friendly Fire, I mean, it's just probably not going to be anything you ever use. So you know what? I just grabbed a third level in Fighter, and I took Battlemaster. I wondered if I could even find three maneuvers I wanted in this character, and lo and behold, I did. Now, Ambush allows us to add our superiority die to an initiative roll, and I mean, that's going to be a number of my dice right there, because I'm going to use this in every combat. Bait and Switch gives a nice switcheroo with an ally, and one of you gets a good armor class boost. And then we have Commanding Presence, gives advantage on some Charisma ability checks. So yeah, if you want the extra Sorcery Point and the 5th level spell slot, I get that. Go back to Sorcerer for the final level. I don't think it's that big a difference either way, but I like initiative boosts. And that's Blow Their Mind, the third build, using Tasha's Summons. What I really like about this particular build, and I'm just going to be blunt here, it's the summon that's least likely to die in combat. That big ranged attack, super nice. I originally wanted a ranged attack on the Summon Undead spell with the Dread Necromancer 2, but I explained in that video why I kind of had to go a different way. But here, we get all that ranged attack goodness, and lots of nice non-concentration spells to back our summon creature up. Now these are three concepts, but honestly, if you want to throw these summon spells on your Bard with Magical Secrets, or your higher level Cleric with Summon Celestial, I think those are worthy options too. But really, it will kind of be more of the same. So in my next video, I think we're going to take a break from summoning, at least for now. And until then, I'm going to sit back, relax, and have some fun. D&D is for everyone. Thanks, everybody. Talk to you soon.